Warning, this review will contain spoilers, so if you haven't seen the episode by now, I advise you do so before watching this video. If you decide against this advice, however, you waive the right to inquire about legal recourse in regards to your hurt feelings, because it's all your fault. Also, if you spoil future episodes in the comment section, a fate worse than death will be coming your way. Season 8 is finally here, and I am so happy that I get to finally say that. However, is my enthusiasm in vain, or will this two-part premiere kick things off with a bang? The only way to find out is to see how my review takes it. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Series 2 proper of Pones and Stuff. The return of a two-part premiere highlights that if something is not broken, then there is no need to fix it. Changing the opener to a single episode format was an early signifier of Season 7's cumbersome inconsistencies that plagued its run for me, because you all seem to think a bit differently, but that's how opinions work. This time things are back to normal, supplying us with some fresh new characters, two musical numbers in one freaking episode, and for the first time since Season 3's starting pair, something entirely new, with no continuity from the previous finales or premieres to help it along its way. While some may claim what I've just said is technically incorrect thanks to the feature film, when I put it in the context of the main show, however, I am still 100% right, because ladies and gentlemen, the season 7 finale with the defeat of the Pony of Shadows and the enriching of the land thanks to the Pillars of Equestria did not factor into Twilight's decision. It was all due to the film. So with that in mind, I am a little bit frustrated that that premise and all of the stuff that could come from it was immediately swept under the rug. That being said, the entire premise of the school being founded, teaching new people, and battling with education authorities, especially considering it could have disastrous consequences, doesn't sound like a too bad an idea. That being said, I would have been much more happy if I didn't predict it in my wishlist video and then dismiss it as being over the top. Oh yeah, because it would have happened to Cheerily, not that I thought it was going to happen to the main bloody six. Oh well, beggars can't be choosers, I guess. The same could be said about the premise itself, as I'd be hoping that the writers could take something menial and bureaucratic and turn it into something lively and fun in contrast. However, the episode focused on that bureaucracy with such outstanding density that no wonder the first part struggled to retain interest, as it forced us to live vicariously through the new students, while a turgid pace and a tone of unease and accompanying predictability flowed all over us watching at home, while we patiently waited for the inevitable as conflicts and disequilibriums piled up into one massive crescendo that was definitely well worth waiting for. It was surprisingly painful though in retrospect to couple with the blasé attitude and lack of enthusiasm that Twilight instigated its announcement with, ensuring that I replied in kind with a lack of vigour and real care. Hell, reusing the same standard plot device that the Princess of Friendship usually has, once again being so self-assured of her ideas and blinded to its potential issues and failings, further enforced how entire this first part was, especially as it was the main issue of Shadow Play's first half as well. Despite a littering of funny moments and continuity from the movie and past seasons coming through to the forefront unexpectedly, it all still felt cumbersome and overly serious, especially as it played its themes of individuality versus conformity and inclusivity against draconian authority segregation and rules with such a massive lack of subtlety that it really couldn't have made its statement of intent any more obvious. It caused further irritation as it overshadowed and overwhelmed the solid work that the conflicts and the narrative structure put forward, not allowing their work to shine through as brightly as it could have. However, the second part ramped up the pace, action, emotional investment, and a clear endgame from the full-blown political overtones to make it as exciting and as enthralling as a premiere or finale can be, giving the new students more room to manoeuvre and showcase themselves, while also allowing the main six teachers to not be burdened by their new roles as much, making that frown I had turn into an outright beaming smile, as the messages that the themes outlined 
all managed to come through with impressive power that worked for all the fractured story could do to muster up support for them. Even though they couldn't be easily adapted to the viewers' normal lives, which stopped them from being outright successes. Because like in the show, changing how teaching or schooling is run for a few people's sake is not going to go down well. Which means that for whatever successes this episode has, there is a downside that takes it by the scruff of the neck and decidedly throttles it. The Jekyll and Hyde contrast on show from this two-parter is really emblematic for how irritating it was to watch, because you had such a foreshadowable conclusion and very tedious, tedious 22 minute start that they thought as a writing team, oh, they could have probably get really annoyed with this, so why don't we give them a second part that is balls to the wall fun and exciting? The problem is, it then makes me question why you couldn't do that from the get-go to really enrich the experience, because all the good premieres, Season 1, Season 2, Season 4, Season 5, all of those kept us gripped from the moment they began. Which is not what happened here, because it just kind of toddled along, not really doing the best it could to make its premise that interesting. Meaning on a story front, it ran itself into the ground before everything else could even try to muster a response. And despite some good things on offer, my enthusiasm was not that high. It was a turbulent wave of discontent. That being said, it allowed the writing of the characters and, in general, the themes that came with it a chance to really make themselves known. And while the message already did its job to bolster it up with a nice kick up the arse, all I was hoping from then was that the music could finally do its job and make us all happy. And you know what? Because of two musical numbers, it managed to do the one thing that the premise and story could not do on its own two feet, which is speed it the hell up. School of Friendship and Friendship Always Wins are two songs that, while contrasting in moods, instrumental tone, and vocal power, were cut from the same cloth, bridging the gap between the two parts and their inclusion well. They're bouncy and alive, while proving to be as abrasive and tender as they require to be, respectively, engaging the characters in the scenes they're in. They are good songs, but once I heard them, a faint whiff of deja vu came over me making me realise that while it is good to hear a duo of songs in an episode for the first time in what seemed like ages, they both sounded similar to ones we've heard in the past, especially regarding how prevalent this Broadway style of bombastic exuberance was utilised in the movie to outstanding effect, making these two feel quite stale in contrast to them. And I understand that this series has a tried and tested format for its musical numbers, but I would have liked to have seen some new genres, time signatures, instruments, and singers here in order to spice things up. Then again, if these ideas are put into consideration further down the line for episodes and seasons going forward, I will not be bogged down by this sudden realisation as much as I am right now. These two songs are fine, but after the movie, I am expecting a lot more from Dan Ingram, and I love his work as you all may know, but in all seriousness, I need some better songs, please. Knowing you, sir, you can get it done. The background music, on the other hand, was once again under the terms and conductorship of one Mr. William Anderson. And he did exactly what he has done for most of the last season, which is create BGMs that are as understated and used to very little effect as they could be, only complementing on this occasion moments where Chancellor Naysay made his domineering presence known. In fact, it worked so well that he was the standout performer amongst a very bountiful cast, as Maurice LaMarche, the well-known voice actor behind Brain and Kiff Crocker, delivered such a professional and passionate performance, it ensured a villain was so easily hateable for his separationist, authoritarian, and self-righteous rhetoric that he became so memorable that I actually enjoyed watching him on screen. That is saying something, he's not gonna be like a hate sink of many an episode past where he just falls into obscurity. We are going to remember Chancellor Naysay until the end of bloody time. And the fact is, the character was written to where he had power that even usurped Celestia, something that he used to incredible advantage to showcase how much of a threat he was, serving as a stark reminder that Equestria may have made small leaps and bounds over the seasons to enrich itself with harmony, but many are still stuck in the past, resistant to change, and against the idea of consensus-based thinking. 
He took the racism that was set up in Heartwarming Eve and the Times They Are a Changeling and teased in Triple Threat, shoving them right to the forefront as the leaders or representatives of the ponies, changelings, yaks, griffins, dragons and hippogriffs all nearly went to war over his incendiary actions and words. And while I appreciated that immensely, these leaders in their positions in this episode were only there to support their offspring that they chaperoned and give the conflicts that would been set up just now even more clout to stand up with, making them not seem as important as they highlight in their titles alone. Speaking of these students, Yona the Yak, Smolder the Dragon, Sambar the Pony, Acellus the Changeling, Silverstream the Hippogriff, and Gallus the Griffin, they were written as petulant and vibrant as children of different species could be, showcasing their flaws and strengths in the short amount of time they were on screen together, giving us enough depth and expandable elements so that future episodes could benefit from exploiting them, as they injected freshness into a roster that was packed with familiar faces that stuck to their rigid, cliched personality guns ever more so than usual, all the while occasionally reminding me why this is a positive in the first place with some well-timed jokes and visual gags, something that the main six supporting cast often do, and I'm very thankful here as it saved the first part from tanking immensely and making the second work out very well in its favour. As for Twilight, her overconfidence in the face of unforeseen problems may have been something that I've noted is incredibly overused, but much like the feature film, seeing her crack emotionally under this pressure and rebound with as much vigour as she did is wonderful to see. However, its good vibes are undone by a lacklustre voice acting performance by Tara Strong, who in my opinion phoned in her performance and some scenes were really undermined despite what they brought to the table thematically. And while Starlight's role was too small for my liking, she provided the rebellious and free-thinking attitude that makes her character so wonderful to turn the episode's momentum around and remind me why I love her so much to begin with. That being said, having a total of 19 characters to get airtime here would mean that this category was bound to have a problem balancing them all. And while it was a valiant effort to try and do so, it wasn't as successful as it could have been. By this point, you may be thinking to yourselves, why have I not mentioned the animation? Well, here we are. Outside of a slew of new character designs, one or two great outfits, a new location sandwiched in there briefly, and the design of the school itself, there really wasn't that much to shout about. It was just enough to stop me from not scoring it at all, but not enough substance for me to really mention it with enough vigor and enthusiasm. You can hear it in the tone of my voice right now, which goes hand in hand with describing my experience of this episode. I'm excited one minute and definitely disappointed the next. If there's one thing that I can praise this premiere for doing, it's highlighting that the writers and showrunners were listening to us. We noted many times how some things were really stale in this show, and thanks to what they put forward here, it's a shot in the arm that they believe will work and make this show continue for quite some time to come. We now have a story arc that can accompany the rest of this season and give us something fresh, while throwing in enough twists and turns in order to enrich it and hopefully benefit us with a watching experience we can be happy about. However, to burst my bubble, it was set up with a premise that was facilitated without much care, especially in its first part where I as a viewer felt like I was being shortchanged, and that really is not on. After Celestial Advice did the same last season, I expected there to be more meat for me to chomp on this time around, and most of the time, I bit into straight bone. The animation left me picking up scraps, and the voice acting outside of Morris LaMarche's amazing efforts either sounded burnt out or over the top to a point where they just couldn't complement or boost up what we had. That being said though, the themes and structure of the story, as well as the messages they bolstered, the solid showing from the new and old characters, and a good effort from the musical numbers, saved this difficult episode's blushes, and created the uneasy yet fun atmosphere that a premiere or finale should have. I went from being annoyed to hyped over the course of this 44 minute romp, and it came with me being more assured than ever that the standard that we got was sufficient. Not great, or amazing, or bad, or terrible, just sufficient. It's not the best premiere, or the worst either. There was enough here to where I can say that it was bang on average. It did what it could, but it needed a lot more finesse and bountiful extras to take it where others have trodden before it. 
I may be looking forward to what this episode is set up for the season, but I do so with bated breath, as it could be a lot better than what we've seen in this two-parter. That being said, being neither terrible or amazing could keep my hype mediated for the 24 adventures that are still to come in Season 8. Overall, School Days scored a total of 13 out of 25, which is a C. And yes, that is bang on average. If you don't think so, you may have to ask me how my rating system works. It's been nearly a year since I outlined it. You may be in the need of a refresher. In closing, you can all plainly see and hear just how conflicted I am about this episode, because for everything I say that's good about it, there's an equal bad thing to just come in and spoil everyone's fun. Well, actually, my fun, because I'm guessing you lot all have conflicting opinions about this too, because this is one of those episodes that's incredibly divisive. You either love it or you hate it. Which means me, and where I stand, smack bang in the middle, plateauing that divide, is relatively fine as far as I'm concerned. That being said, usually if I love an episode, you guys find a way to disagree, and vice versa, so... The fact this has happened is quite a wonderful thing, and it reminds me that an episode that reaches this rating should not be lambasted by me, because anything that gets an average rating or above, as I've said from the get-go, deserves a thumbs up for getting there. <laughs> Which means I really shouldn't be this angry, but here we are, this is just how annoying yet fun this episode could be. I just hope in the future they manage to nail down exactly what they want from an episode to ensure I don't go through this roller coaster of emotions again. The episode itself was fine, and the premise has a lot of potential to go somewhere, but it all depends on how the writers, voice actors, animators, and showrunners put them together, because the eight to nine months that are to follow from here should be a lot of intriguing fun, right? If it ends up being predictable and boring, I'm not going to be the happiest person in the world, but I'll keep my expectations reserved for now to ensure I'm not unnecessarily critical like I've been today in the episodes to come. So I'm looking forward to seeing what Season 8 can throw at me. Surprise me and give me something good, because if not, you may end up like Season 7, and I don't want to have to go down that inconsistent route again, that's for sure. Before I go, I have to make a very important announcement that due to being in London with no internet connection and then subsequently in New Orleans from March the 30th through to April 13th, I am not going to be able to make pwned and stuff for the next two episodes that are upcoming. Because seriously, with all the wrestling videos I'm going to be doing out there in New Orleans, there is no way I'm going to have enough time to write the reviews, watch the episodes and analyze them for the reviews, and then make these videos possible in that time period. However, when I arrive back in the UK, jet lag may be kicking me in the teeth to where a third episode is potentially missed on top of the prior two I've mentioned. However, if you are worried that these are going to be overshadowed and forgotten completely, well, do not worry about it, as in the future, a missed episode special looking at those episodes and any more in the future that come from it will be done. Just keep an eye on the Twitter at CCNetworkYT so you do not miss a thing. I have been Freddy Thomas, you've been people watching, this has been another episode of Pones and Stuff for the CC Network, and I will see you all next time.